Uh, I had two very good questions over the break, and I'll share them with you. Um, one person asked, uh, what is a corrugated flamelet, and what is a distributed flamelet? So maybe I should draw one. Let's see, I guess I can draw right on this. That's a, a wrinkled flamelet right here. It's a laminar flamelet. It's got all the properties of a laminar flame, including a laminar flame thickness, but it's wrinkled. Okay, that would be the one region in the Borghi diagram. If, it's, if it pinches off, which means it's highly unsteady, then you would get a, a, a region here and a region here, and you might get some regions in here. Now, uh, uh, these are products, these are reactants, and so in this region, you'd have some, somehow some products that kind of got trapped inside here, in with the reactants, and then out here, uh, you'd have reactants that are trapped by the products. So this is what we call corrugated. Uh, now, uh, Professor Bray at Cambridge came up with this idea, and um, everybody likes it. It doesn't really mean anything, because it, what difference does it make if you have islands or no islands? Uh, it does affect the total surface area somewhat, but. That's what we call corrugated, but they're all continuous laminar flames surrounding these zones. Now, um, what Norbert Peters was talking about was a broadened preheat zone. So if you just take the same picture now, and you say that instantaneously, all of these boundaries are a lot thicker. And the turbulence is getting in to the uh, preheat zone, and the diffusion um, uh, caused by the, the, the uh, diffusion of heat caused by the turbulence will broaden the preheat zone. Now we have what uh, we call a broadened uh, preheat thin reaction zone. And uh, the question is, can a flamelet model model that and uh, many modelers say, yes, it can. It's just a stretched flamelet. Uh, in other words, you take whatever profiles. You know, a flamelet model basically says that you have profiles going across the flame. So if these are the reactants and these are the products, uh, the temperature will go up like this, and uh, the, the uh, reactants go down like that. So this is temperature, and these are, let's say, Y of the fuel. Now, those profiles can be predicted by Chemkin, but that's for a laminar flame that's very thin. And now, the flamelet idea would be, well, just spread them out. You know, in, you, know you take this, this x-axis now and make it spread everything out. You get the same, you, they, you hypothesize that you get the same profiles that you get from Chemkin, but um, things are spread out. If, you'd have to figure out how, how much to spread it and that depends on the turbulence. So that's how the flamelet people would uh, modify their models to handle broadened flamelets. But then, uh, if you have broken flamelets, you just imagine lots of these boundaries, wherever they are, are just extinguished. And then the flamelet modelers have a problem, because uh, what do you do at the boundary? There's a problem there. And then, like I said, if, if uh, if somehow gases would mix and you get distributed reactions. Now, what's a distributed reaction? Um, the way we've defined it in our work, it's somewhat arbitrary, but Norbert Peters said that a, uh, a flamelet is something in which the, the gradients in this direction are much higher than the gradients in this direction. So a flamelet is thin. I mean, well, it's thin, com it's thin in one direction compared to its dimension in the other direction. So when I say thin, it doesn't have to be the laminar thickness, but it has to be, the thickness in this direction has to be a lot less than the thickness in that direction. So if this is a, a basketball uh, or a football, you know, then obviously it's not a, a flamelet, it's not a layer, because it doesn't have one dimension that's significantly thinner than the others. 
And so you know, you pick a number, let's say four, okay? If you had something like this, its uh, dimension this way is one-fourth uh, its dimension this way. That might be right on the boundary between what we call a flamelet or a distributed. But we haven't, we haven't really uh, decided on a good definition of distributed reactions, especially when uh, um, we have shapes of reaction zones that are, uh, are different uh, in every location. That's one of the problems. Well, in this, um, this high-velocity Bunsen burner that we've been running, uh, my students measured the burning fraction. And what they're finding is that um, even at very high turbulence levels that are 10 times the level of turbulence in previous studies, we still uh, get at least 82% uh, of the region burning. So uh, we can't really call this broken. It's, you know, it's starting maybe to break, but it's not really broken. <clears throat> now, one thing we noticed in our experiments is that um, if we make sure that all the products are kept hot and homogeneous, we don't see many uh, broken regions. On the other hand, uh, well, uh, let me just say, um, how do you do that? You, you have a hot, hot co-flow of, of hot products all surrounding the flame, and so the flame can only exist in these, this hot co-flow. And that would make sense that, that if you uh, strain a flame, it's hard to extinguish it if there's hot gas on one side of it. Um, uh, the second question that was asked was, um, was what about uh, uh, counterflow flames? Now, you can create a counterflow premix flame. Um, let me draw that over here, if you can see it. And again, uh, Professor Law and his uh, graduates have worked out this problem very nicely. If you have a If you have reactants coming out of a tube and you have reactants coming out of another tube, you will form a stagnation point right in the middle. And if you light this thing off, you'll see a flame that sits here and another flame that sits here. So this is the so-called twin flame. May have been invented right here at Princeton, I'm not sure. but. If not, you'll let me know, right? Um, but we have reactants, and so everything between these two flames has to be products, and so it's going to go out, radially out. So if you, um, if you make the velocity of both of these streams high enough, you extinguish both of these flames, and you, you, you create like a hole right here and another hole right here. And... Um, um, so you can extinguish a premix flame. So the question is, why aren't we seeing holes in our flames? Well, um, this is kind of a unrealistic situation. First of all, it's a steady strain rate. So there's a there's a, uh, a velocity gradient that's stretching the flame, and you know it's like pulling. It's like a rubber band. You're pulling it this way with this velocity field, and it's steady. And um, in the turbulent flame, you never have a steady uh, straining of the flame. It, it's always jumping around, and the eddies are going through. And so the eddy only goes through a certain amount of time. And so the flame can kind of recover. And apparently, it doesn't strain out as much as it would in this uh, steady state situation. And the other thing is, these flames uh, are not free to really move. They, they, with a turbulent uh, Bunsen flame, it can, it can flop around and maybe move to another place where there isn't so much strain. So it's a, it's a nice little experiment, but again, it points out that uh, maybe these uh, counterflow flame examples are not exactly what's happening at each point in a turbulent flame. 
Certainly not in the premix case. Anyway, um, uh, there are some students going to Seoul, and they're going to talk about the fact that we have a bunch of data points that are above uh, this upper black line, which is predicted to be broken, but as, as far as we can tell, it's not broken. Another thing we see is um, really, really uh, densely packed flamelets. And uh, these measurements were actually taken at Wright-Patterson um, with Cam Carter. And so we needed uh, better lasers. And these are all kilohertz images. And um, these incredibly wrinkled flames. So the question is, uh, maybe we're starting to get distributed. I mean, what, what is the definition of distributed? I said it was a, like a football-shaped reaction region. But if, if, if you had a whole lot of thin flamelets and they were all really packed together, maybe that's essentially distributed. It certainly would act like it distributed. Um, you know, uh, we don't know the temperature field. That's one thing that uh, we may want to measure. But um, we may want to. Now, um, we do see these globs of partially distributed flames, but most of the time we see these when the hot gases uh, are uh, diluted with some cold gases, and that helps to break the flame. So here's some images of the reaction zone, and uh, yeah, yeah, uh, here's a better picture of it. Um, in this. Uh, uh, now, this is simultaneous CH and OH. And this is done at 10 kilohertz uh, at the Air Force lab but, uh, with my students. And <clears throat> what you see um, uh, is a, uh, a boundary of CH where uh, it's, it's kind of the, uh, the brighter line at and then behind it is a uh, fuzzy region, which is the OH. <clears throat> and most of the time, the CH layer is continuous. But then in a few places, it just breaks. And we are investigating this. And what we're seeing is that there's these islands of dark blue in the OH, which means some cold gases have been allowed to be entrained into the products. And we purposely um, reduce the cold flow to allow this to happen. <clears throat> so we're investigating the idea that you can break up premixed flames if they're stratified. In a real gas turbine or rocket, you wouldn't have continuously hot gases on one side of a premix flame. Um, um, so uh, if, if you put stratification in, you can um, cause regions to be kind of cold and, and break up. Uh, that's a real challenge for modeling, because we don't know how to really handle uh, broken reaction zones. But it, here again, um, if we purposely mix in some cold gases with the products, get all sorts of broken zones. Um, we, we created a, like a bluff body type geometry where we have a, have a, um, um, a, a cylinder. Well, actually, it's a cone, a cone shape, and then a flat uh, base to it. And things recirculate, and so it's a uh, this, this allows more um, cold air to mix in with the hot products, and we get all sorts of distributed and broken zones. But this is not what we get with a, uh, a uh, Bunsen flame that has hot gases uh, um, all around it. So uh, this might lead us to an idea of why, why we sometimes see broken zones, and it may not have anything to do with the amount of turbulence. It may have to do with stratification. So our conclusion that we'll be talking about in Seoul is that uh, even if you go to extreme turbulence level, the preheat zone gets thick. The reaction zones don't get thick. 
but no broken reactions are seen as long as we have hot gases on the product side. But if some outside air is entrained into the products, we see broken reactions. Uh, distributed reactions were not observed, but only um, little globs of partially distributed reactions. Now, uh, somebody needs to do this now with strong recirculation in a gas turbine type device. Somebody needs to do this with really preheated uh, reactants. And somebody needs to do this uh, uh, um, you know, with different fuels. So these conclusions are limited to one experiment, one fuel, methane, and um, a Bunsen device. <coughs> one thing that uh, Professor Ju is doing here at Princeton is he's looking at additional axes on the Borghi diagram. Um, one might be a residence time of eddies in the flame. One might be the initial temperature of the reactants. And one might be the degree of stratification, which would help to explain our work. In other words, um, should we throw the Borghi diagram out, or should we just add some more axes and, and try to save it? That's another question that somebody brought up. And a lot of experimentalists would say, oh, just throw that thing out. It, it's just too simplistic. But other people, like Professor Williams, I don't know if you know Professor Williams. He has pretty strong, uh, since he has one of those lines on there, you know, he's, 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 he's holding on to that line. <laughs> He said, keep it and just fix it. OK. Um, well, I, I discussed this um, in my last lecture, but um, one of the students in my group was measuring the turbulent burning velocity. And again, we see this bending of the curves. Now, what, uh, what uh, Tim Wobble was arguing in his paper is that um, the curve bends over because the eddies don't get to the reaction zone. So um, you know that little slide I showed a few minutes ago? I showed the eddies going into the preheat zone, and the preheat zone's really thick. They don't make it to the reaction zone. So the reaction zone is basically living a laminar life. Uh, that would explain, I'm not sure it's the only explanation, but it would explain why this curve bends over. That is, if you Add more turbulence, you're making the preheat zone really thick, and it's protecting the reaction zone from these nasty eddies that are trying to wrinkle it. And therefore, uh, even though you put in more turbulence, the turbulence doesn't do much, and so the curve kind of bends over. And uh, But we don't have proof of that. We need to actually. Uh, take m movies of the eddies going through the flame and see, you know, do they, do they disappear as they go through the flame? And don't know that. Uh, and so um, to handle the bending, you can just add another term to the equation here. This is the simple equation I mentioned yesterday. And um, the turbulent burning velocity is given by the shelkin baumkohler theory. Now we, we know the curve bends over from the experimental data, and so we could add a term like that. That's just a curve fit, and the question is, do we have any theory that could help to explain that? And maybe the destruction of eddies through the turbulence, by the turbulence uh, could explain it. Oh, I might add, in, I'm, um, 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 uh, add that uh, Professor Blanquart at Caltech is doing DNS where he does see these eddies get destroyed as they go through the flame at relatively low Reynolds numbers. And so maybe his computations are the best way to uh, explain burning velocities. Um, so the bending of the turbulent burning velocity curve also could be due to strain causing local extinction. Uh, some theoreticians just say, well, you know, it bends over because there's not so much flame. It's all being extinguished. But we don't see any evidence of the flame being extinguished, so we don't think this, this third item is 
And, you know, if this is a reasonable formula, then you know, what is it? What does it depend on anything more? And what, how do we explain it? And uh, we have extended the burning velocity curve to a very high turbulence level, but we can't explain everything. Anyway, um, we might ask, I've added this slide. Some, some slides are, uh, uh, didn't make it into the, into the uh, handout, and some of them got kind of corrupted. So I was told that I'm going to uh, upload uh, all the slides in the right form into the uh, web version of this. I think the other lecturers can do this too. So at the end of the summer school, you'll have the, the, the good slides. Okay, You can probably throw that out and and uh, print out the, the good ones uh, when you go home. Um, anyway, um, the whole uh, problem of turbulent combustion in the premixed regime is based on, the whole problem is uh, centered on these two red circles. Uh, I'm talking about a, a, a one-dimensional flat flame that's wrinkled um, and, and um, so on the average, uh, if you put the coordinate system on the flame, so it's fixed, and so the gas is coming at it at a, a speed S sub t, that's the turbulent burning velocity. And uh, it defines C as the reactiveness, which is the non-dimensional temperature. Well, it's, a, it's something that goes smoothly up as it, you go through the flame. Now this would be the turbulent flame brush. And um, uh, alpha sub t is the turbulent diffusivity. And it, it's basically the velocity fluctuation times the integral scale. And you can compute that with a Smagorinsky type of analysis if you do a large eddy simulation. So um, that alpha sub t is not too big of a problem. Uh, if you're doing computations, you don't worry about too much. Uh, Everybody sort of believes this Smagorinsky formulation. Uh, if you don't, you, uh, you have to leave the room. You know, I mean, that's, it's like a accepted, but you know, maybe it's not right, but um, it's not the big deal. The big deal is the one on the right, and that is, what is the reaction rate? And as I said last time, it depends on the probability that the flame is at a given point. And the, the two approaches are to use uh, Flame surface density, that's been promoted by Professor Bray at Cambridge and his colleagues in France, uh, Luc Verviche, Denis Venant. They're some of Candel's uh, people. Um, Sebastian uh, trained uh, the whole French group, and uh, he knows them all that quite well. But then there's, the, as I said, the Stanford group, which uh, includes a bunch of uh, German people who are descendants of Professor Peters. Um, so they would, uh, they would use this uh, uh, PDF approach where they would um, assume a laminar flamelet for the W dot P. It would be some, something you'd get from Kemkin, and then you'd have to somehow put the right PDF in. So uh, you know, when you look at all this experimental data, what, is it, what does it imply for modeling? Well, um, you need to have the right PDF shape and the right flame surface density to model the reaction rate, because that's what that last equation said. So we don't have enough good information whether the PDF is a beta function, if it's a bimodal function, a Gaussian function. We don't have enough good information at high Reynolds numbers, intense turbulence. Um, we need to have data like this, which is uh, what my students did, but we need a lot more. Uh, Professor Gilder at Toronto is doing some very nice work like this. And, but we need uh, this kind of curve for lots of uh, experiments, but we need to use modern diagnostics to generate this curve. Now, you, if you've done any reading about turbulent combustion, you've seen this burning velocity curve, and if you look at how it was generated, uh, a lot of the um, data in the past was generated with really old-fashioned methods, um, like Schlieren methods, that 
um, suspect. And the amount of turbulence in front of the flame was me sometimes measured with a hot wire and then assumed that whatever the flame was doing didn't affect it. You know? And we have modern ways of measuring this x-axis, the turbulence level, you know, LDV and laser velocimetry and DIV. And we have modern ways to get the, uh, the uh, burning velocity, which depends on the wrinkled area, which you can get from OH PLIF. So um, uh, we need to redo a lot of this and do it right. And then we need to see if the models can predict the bending of the curve and if they can also predict the surface area, and does the model predict what we measure? And that is that the surface area stops going up with turbulence level, but the burning velocity keeps going up, and we don't understand that. Why is the curve flat? The flame cannot wrinkle anymore, but it propagates faster. But clearly, it, it's getting thicker. As I showed you, the preheat zone is getting really thick. And so it looks like Dom Kohler was, was right in his... Uh, his second postulate. Um, differential broadening. Now, if the preheat layer is broadened, but the reaction zone layer is not broadened, that presents a little problem to the flamelet modelers because they can't just stretch the x-axis. They can't just take a laminar flame set of profiles and just say, hey, let's stretch the x-axis because uh, that would stretch the reaction zone as much as the uh, preheat zone. But maybe they can figure out a way around that by stretching only part of the axis due to turbulence, stretch the preheat zone. Or maybe they won't uh, try to get it exactly in agreement with experiments. But they should make some attempt to try to um, apply uh, flamelet ideas to turbulent flames, uh, they, should, they should try to use some of this experimental data to improve their models. Uh, but if this little picture I drew was right, that the turbulence starts out here and it decays as it goes into the flame, models should explain this. Um, and, uh, uh, the DNS at Caltech is starting to show it. Um, we don't have a good formula. We don't have a good scaling relation. We need better understanding. and We need a model, really. Um, I showed you that stratified flames can become broken because the, the hot products are not always so hot. Um, it would be nice if a model could predict that. It's a challenge that we can throw out, and they don't yet do that. Um, if you did this same sort of experiment now with a spherical flame or a swirl flame, you'd probably get totally different results. And so the question is, why? And we can do DNS, but you know, DNS is like an experiment. It's like a really good experiment. So you do it and you get this, let's say it agrees with the, the experiment. Uh, still haven't explained anything. Then you've got to interrogate the DNS. So actually, if I, was a, if I was a young assistant professor starting out today, I probably wouldn't do experiments. I would, I would go to Jackie Chen and ask her for her DNS, or I'd go to John Bell and ask him for his DNS. And I'd spend six years generating all sorts of interesting uh, papers explaining things using DNS. Now, maybe people don't want to do that. Maybe I wouldn't want to do it either, but it, it'd be, a, <laughs> it'd be a, a, a path. And um, I think it's very important. We just need somebody to do it. But it's not that easy because, you know, if you take a DNS, first of all, uh, John and Jackie tell me that they don't save all their results. You know, it's like at each instant of time, some of you may do DNS. I, I didn't fully realize this until I talked to them, but, you know, they don't have the memory to save every, uh, I mean, it's three-dimensional and in time, they don't have the uh, ability to save every parameter at every grid point in three dimensions and at every time. Uh, so they don't save it. And so if you, if you go back and interrogate it, 
um, you may not have the data that you want. But even if you did have it, then you have to write algorithms. How do you fly, find the flame? You have to define it and in a three-dimensional topology, define the flame. And if it's, if it's broken, you have to define what you mean by broken. All you have is data at good points. It's, it's a huge issue, but um, I know that uh, uh, some students getting their PhDs working on this, and it's, it's, it's very valuable. Um, um, Professor Ju here has shown that preheating the reactants uh, has a big effects on these flames. We need to model that. And if we have JP8, um, uh, that's a uh, hydrocarbon, something like kerosene, you know, C, C10, H20, maybe we could call it. And it will break down to lots of other things, mostly with C and H that are, uh, you know, the H is twice the C. Okay, so it'd be like C4, H8, C5, H10, you know, because it starts out at C10, H20. And so you get a lot of um, simpler fuels. And um, the question is, do they pyrolyze in a layer into these simple fuels, and then are they oxidized later in the flame? Um, what's happening? So get away from methane. You'll go to JP8 if you can. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. So mm -hmm. I was wondering all the time. <laughs> yeah. That's a, the, that's a good question. The question was, the question was, uh, what if you had strong differential diffusion, such as hydrogen air? And uh, uh, we know that it, even at very, very high turbulence levels, that's important. Because uh, you could say, well, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a laminar diffusion problem. How come it's so important? Well, if the flame gets thinner and thinner due to strain, uh, and if the reaction zone doesn't get thicker, only the preheat zone, um, well, um, it doesn't go away. The, the reaction zone stays pretty thin. And so um, um, the uh, diffusion of the radicals is important. Um, the um, uh, experiments that have been run show that if you take a hydrogen flame, premix flame, and you, and you run it <clears throat> really rich, and you run it really lean, and you have the same laminar burning velocity, that the rich hydrogen flame will be very long and have a low burning velocity, whereas the, the lean one will be very short. And, and this is exactly in accordance with uh, the theory of flame stretch and the differential diffusion. So if the... Uh, I guess, if, I guess it's, as long as the reaction zone stays pretty thin, um, these, these differential diffusion things don't go away, you know? And um, um, therefore, the model should explain that. But uh, I think most of the turbulent flame models I know of don't include preferential diffusion. Is that, is that that's, that's what you've found? Uh, I mean, they, they like to just put the turbulent diffusivity in, and then the, the turbulent diffu the diffusion of, of, of heat and the turbulent diffusion of, of species should be about the same. So there are not preferential diffusion effects uh, due to the turbulent diffusivities, but the molecular diffusivities are still there. And anyway, um, um, that needs to be included in the modeling. And, and actually, the, the work of uh, Aspen and Day um, and John Bell, the, LB, the, the Berkeley group, they published a lot of uh, DNS papers showing that uh, turbulent hydrogen flames uh, have very strong uh, uh, preferential diffusion effects. So 
I'm, many years ago, people said, well, if you make it turbulent enough, all these laminar phenomena will go away. But, you know, as long as the flame still is pretty thin at any instant, uh, they don't. Okay, um, you know, this sort of gets to, if you have a workshop and you are getting people together and you want to compare models and experiments, where do you start? And I think many times people don't do it right. They, they compare profiles of this or profiles of that, and does that really prove the model is right or wrong? I mean, I think we should start with the global metrics first. If it's a premix flame, uh, we have measurements of global consumption speed, burning velocity, as a function of velocity fluctuations, and the curve bends. You know, if the model doesn't get that right, then why are we spending a lot of time analyzing the rest of it? And this is part of some of these workshops. They, they try to get the models to work, at least uh, get to work right in the global sense first. The flame brush thickness, that tells you uh, over what distance is this turbulent flame oscillating. And then you can do this for Bunsen flame, or if it's a spherical flame, as the flame gets bigger, it gets more wrinkled and gets thicker. We know, we've measured how thick it gets, the model better get that right. A carbon monoxide is often used because uh, it's a, uh, something that uh, tells you the deviation from chemical equilibrium uh, from fast chemistry. In other words, if you have carbon monoxide uh, most likely there's some slow, slower than average chemistry going on. And um, oftentimes the models don't get the carbon monoxide right. And you can get one number for a given flame. You can, you can integrate all the carbon monoxide, all the grams of CO produced from the entire flame and divide by the kilograms of fuel and you get this emission index. And you would hope that a model would get that number right. If it doesn't, then you say the chemistry is kind of weak. Now, this, the Sandia people have done something like that uh, for the non-premix turbulent flames. They make sure that the flame length is right in the, in the model. But you should actually vary the fuel velocity, the, any co-flow air velocity or cross-flow air velocity and get an entire uh, curve and see if the predicted flame length is right. Uh, a lot of times the DNS people don't do this because they, they don't want to run their code 10 times to show that the curve goes up and bends over. Um, and so they just take one computation and they might get the right flame length for that one case, but you know, we'd, we'd like to get more than that. But even with the models, you know, you can, you can um, any turbulence model will have a certain number of constants in it that have to be set. I think we've, the whole community has come to the realization that it's impossible to model turbulent combustion um, uh, with a model, uh, not DNS, but a model, uh, unless you have some adjustable constants, the Smagorinsky constant, reaction rate constants, et cetera. But if you can keep them to a minimum, and then you can actually vary parameters such as the fuel velocity, air velocity, and for the same constants, you get the right trends, then you can have some confidence in the model. And the Sandia people are using carbon monoxide emission index as a, a metric. And then, then you can go, the next step would be to then look at the profiles. Once you get these right, you look at the profiles, and then what some of the funding agencies are doing now including our Air Force, is then let's look at the terms in the modeling equations. What terms can we measure? Like that, I, I, I showed the reaction rate, W dot. It'd be nice if we could measure that, and then we could say that's right or not. Flame surface density, that's one of the terms in the equations. We can measure that. Um, turbulent diffusivity, well, we, we might be able to measure that. You know, we can certainly measure U prime, and we can measure the integral scale, so maybe we can do that. Uh, but to really assess a model, 
you need to go to these different levels of fidelity, starting with the global metrics and going to the actual terms in the equation. Okay, I think it's time for a break. And so let's take a, let's see, we, we end at 5.30, so um, let's take a 15 minute break and I'll talk about kilohertz measurements next.